If you really want to understand the rape and slaughter being committed in the name of Allah by the Islamic State, you have to study the history of Muhammad and his companions, a history found in the Hadith and the Sirah literature. But you can get a pretty good outline of the Islamic State's message and tactics by reading the Quran, which Muslims believe to be the direct word of Allah. For those of you who don't have time to read the Quran, here's a top 10 list of the most essential verses for understanding ISIS. In the Bible, Jesus says that God loves everyone. In the Quran, not so much. Surah 3, verse 32. Say, obey Allah and the Apostle, but if they turn back, then surely Allah does not love the unbelievers. According to the Quran, Allah only loves obedient Muslims. I wonder why ISIS doesn't seem to have much love for non-Muslims. Believe it or not, Allah's complete lack of love for non-Muslims plays a role in how non-Muslims are to be treated. Surah 48, verse 29. Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, and those who are with him are severe against unbelievers and merciful among themselves. Those who are with Muhammad, i.e. Muslims, are severe against whom? Against unbelievers. They're merciful to whom? Only to their fellow Muslims. But politicians and the media just can't figure out why ISIS is so severe against non-Muslims. There are lots of ways to be severe against unbelievers. Here's one, Surah 4, verse 24. Also forbidden are women already married, except those captives and slaves whom your right hands possess. This may be confusing without the historical context, which you can read in Sunan Abu Dawud 2150. When Muhammad won the Battle of Altas, Allah had already revealed that Muslims were free to rape their female captives. But at Altas, the Muslim army captured certain women along with their husbands, and some of the Muslims started wondering if raping these women counted as adultery, because they were married. That's when Allah revealed Surah 4, verse 24, which says that married women are indeed forbidden as sex partners unless they're your captives. If they're your captives, rape them all you want. Allah couldn't conceivably care less that they're married. Heard about any groups raping their female captives recently? What about people who try to stop the Islamic State from establishing Sharia? Surah 5, verse 33. The punishment of those who wage war against Allah and his apostle and strive to make mischief in the land is only this, that they should be murdered or crucified, or their hands and their feet should be cut off on opposite sides, or they should be imprisoned. This shall be as a disgrace for them in this world, and in the hereafter they shall have a grievous chastisement. Notice that there are several penalties, including death, crucifixion, and dismemberment, for the vague crime of making mischief in the land. Since the crime is vague, Muslim groups like ISIS can pack all kinds of offenses into this verse. And yet, the U.S. State Department just put out a video making fun of ISIS for crucifying their enemies. When Muhammad was completely outnumbered, he had to put up with idolaters. But once he had the most powerful army in Arabia, the message of Islam became convert or die. Surah 9 verse 5 contains Allah's final marching orders on dealing with idolaters. When the sacred months have passed, slay the idolaters wherever you find them, and take them captive, and besiege them, and prepare for them each ambush. But if they repent, and establish worship, and pay the poor due, then leave their way free. Lo, Allah is forgiving, merciful. So kill them unless they convert to Islam. Sound familiar? Since idolaters have to convert or die, you might be wondering why ISIS gives Christians a third option, the option of paying jizya, tribute money. Sur 9, verse 29. Fight those who believe not in Allah, nor the last day, nor hold that forbidden which hath been forbidden by Allah and his messenger, nor acknowledge the religion of truth from among the people of the book, the people of the book are Jews and Christians, until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. So the benefit of being a Jew or a Christian, according to Allah, is that you won't necessarily be slaughtered for refusing to convert. You have the option of paying tribute money to Muslims in acknowledgement of your inferiority. Is it just me, or is ISIS following the Quran to the letter? 
But ISIS doesn't just attack unbelievers. Muslims are also targeted. Why is that? Surah 9, verse 73. O prophet, strive hard against the unbelievers and the hypocrites and be unyielding to them. And their abode is hell and evil is the destination. The Arabic for strive hard here is a form of the word jihad. So Muslims are commanded to wage jihad not only against unbelievers, but also against hypocrites, people who claim to be Muslims but aren't doing what Allah tells them to do. The penalty for hypocrisy can vary depending on the severity of the hypocrisy, but when Muslims deviate from core Islamic doctrine, they find themselves in the apostate category, and the penalty for apostasy is death. So when ISIS kills Muslims who aren't adhering to central Muslim doctrines, they're just doing what Allah commands. But what about all the peaceful, westernized Muslims who condemn killing in the name of Allah? Sadly, Islam isn't defined by westernized Muslims. It's defined by Allah, who says in Surah 9, verse 111, Surely Allah has bought of the believers their persons and their property for this, that they shall have the garden. They fight in Allah's way, so they slay and are slain. Allah defines believers as those who slay and get slain. They keep killing until they get killed. Doesn't sound much like our peaceful Muslim neighbors, but it sounds an awful lot like ISIS. Muslims are only allowed to seek peace when they aren't in a position to violently subjugate their enemies. Allah says in Surah 47, verse 35, be not weary and faint-hearted, crying for peace, when you should be uppermost, for Allah is with you and will never put you in loss for your good deeds. When the Muslim community is strong enough to slay the idolaters and to subjugate the Jews and Christians and to fight the hypocrites, peace is not an option. If you seek peace when you should be uppermost, you won't have much ground to stand on when ISIS knocks on your door and tells you that you're a hypocrite. This final verse might seem out of place because it's not about rape or slaughter, but you can't really understand how the verses about rape and slaughter fit into Islam as a whole without understanding Surah 2, verse 106. Whatever communications we abrogate or cause to be forgotten, we bring one better than it or like it. Do you not know that Allah has power over all things? People in the West have been trying to condemn the Islamic State by quoting peaceful verses of the Quran. How can you guys call yourselves Muslims when the Quran says there's no compulsion in religion? But those peaceful verses were revealed before Allah commanded his followers to slay idolaters and to subjugate Jews and Christians and to fight hypocrites. So the most important verse you need to know if you want to understand the Islamic State is Surah 2, verse 106, which lays out the doctrine of abrogation. Earlier verses get abrogated or canceled by later verses, which means that versions of Islam that oppose the sort of violence being committed by the Islamic State are now obsolete.